Today, I've got two eerie tales that are sure to send a shiver down your spine. The first is about a ghost train that appears at the stroke of midnight, its haunting whistle echoing through the darkness, leaving a trail of fear in its wake. The second story reveals how an ancient coin uncovers a dark curse. Stick around as we dive into these chilling mysteries. You won't want to miss a single twist. Story Main The Phantom Train Chair by Creepy Stories JR The clock on the wall at Rosie's Diner kept ticking steadily as it moved closer to the end of another night shift. Pine Hollow, the small town where the diner is located, was mostly quiet and deserted by this hour. The only sounds came from the humming refrigerator, an occasional clink of a coffee cup, and the soft radio playing in the corner. It was just after 3 a.m., and I was wrapping up my nightly tasks, wiping down counters and stacking chairs to get the diner ready for the morning crew. I'd been working night shifts at Rosie's for almost a year now and had grown used to the quiet solitude of these late hours. Usually, the silence was soothing, giving me time to think and enjoy the peace. But tonight felt different. There was an unusual heaviness in the air, a stillness that made me feel uneasy. I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was, but something definitely didn't seem right. As I finished cleaning the last table, I heard a distant, mournful whistle echoing through the quiet streets. My hand froze midwipe and I listened closely. The sound was faint, but it gave me goosebumps. It wasn't something I'd ever heard before in all my nights at Rosie's. I walked over to the window and looked outside into the darkness. The street was empty except for a flickering street lamp at the corner. As I stood there, listening, the whistle sounded again, this time closer and louder. It was definitely a train but Pine Hollow had no tracks nearby. The nearest railway was miles away and didn't run through town. Yet, as I listened more closely, I could hear the faint sound of a steam engine chugging and wheels clattering on tracks. A sense of unease washed over me. I stepped outside into the cool night air and scanned the empty street. The train sound grew louder, like it was getting closer. But there were no tracks, no train in sight, just an empty road and silent buildings. And then, as the clock struck 3.15 a.m., I saw something strange. A ghostly train appeared out of the darkness, its form hazy and unclear, like a mirage. The engine looked ancient, belching steam that faded into the night. The cars were dimly lit with an eerie blue glow from their flickering windows. I stood there, frozen in place, unable to look away as the phantom train rumbled past the diner. Its mournful whistle echoed through the streets, and I felt a strange urge to follow it and board the train. I shook my head, trying to clear my mind, but the pull was strong, almost irresistible. My feet started moving on their own, carrying me toward the train as it slowed to a stop just beyond Rosie's diner. The door of one car creaked open, revealing a dark, shadowy interior. For a moment, I felt panic rise within me, with a voice in my head screaming for me to turn back and run. But the pull was too strong, the compulsion too overwhelming. And just as I was about to step forward, the train started moving again. The door shut with a slam, and the engine roared back to life, picking up speed and disappearing into the darkness. Its mournful whistle faded away until I couldn't hear it anymore. I stood there trembling, my heart racing. 
the street fell silent once more, as if nothing had happened. But I knew what I had seen wasn't just a figment of my imagination. The phantom train was real, and it had almost taken me with it. The next day at Rosie's diner felt like a blur. I went through the motions, serving customers, refilling coffee cups, taking orders, but my mind kept drifting back to that night. The memory of the ghostly train, its eerie whistle, the overwhelming urge to board it, it all replayed in my head like a nightmare, but I knew it had been real. I tried to push aside those unsettling thoughts and focus on my work, but it wasn't easy. The phantom train had left a mark on me, a nagging sense of unease that refused to go away. I found myself checking the clock more often, dreading when 3.15 a.m. would roll around again. As the night dragged on, my anxiety grew. I kept glancing out the window, half, expecting to see that ghostly train appear once more, but the streets remained empty and silent. The regular customers filtered out one by one until I was alone in the diner as the hour grew late. By 3 a.m., everything was quiet again. I tried to keep busy with cleaning, hoping it would distract me from the growing dread in my stomach. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was coming, something inevitable. The clock on the wall chimed softly, signaling the arrival of 3.15 a.m. My heart raced as I froze listening intently for any sound that might break the silence. At first, everything was quiet. Just the low hum of the diner's lights and the faint buzz of the refrigerator. But then, I heard it. A distant, mournful whistle that sent shivers down my spine. My heart started pounding as I rushed to the window. The street outside was empty, just like it had been the night before. But the sound of the train grew louder, echoing through the streets, and I felt that same pull, that overwhelming urge to follow it. Then, out of the darkness, the ghostly train appeared once more. It materialized in front of the diner, its hazy form shimmering faintly in the dim light. The mournful whistle blew again, intensifying the compulsion inside me drawing me closer to the door. I knew I shouldn't go outside and get closer to the train, but the urge was too strong. My feet moved on their own, carrying me toward the door. I reached for the handle, my hand trembling, and stepped outside into the cold night air. The train started slowing down again, just like it did the night before. The doors of one car creaked open, revealing a dark interior that beckoned to me, I took a step forward, feeling an almost unbearable pull, as if some unseen force was dragging me toward the train. But this time, I resisted. I planted my feet firmly on the ground and refused to move. The train's whistle wailed again, a desperate, mournful sound that seemed to call out to me, but I didn't budge. The doors stayed open for a moment longer, as if waiting for me to board. Then, with a loud clang, they slammed shut. The engine roared to life, and the train began moving, picking up speed and disappearing into the darkness once more. I stood there gasping for breath, my heart pounding in my chest. The street was silent again, but the pull, the compulsion to follow, still lingered like a nagging feeling at the back of my mind. I knew I couldn't keep resisting the train's call forever. It would return, and each time, the pull would be stronger, harder to resist. I had to find out what the train wanted and why it was appearing to me. The draw was too powerful to ignore, and I needed to uncover the truth before it was too late. The next morning, I decided to ask around town. Pine Hollow is small and most people know each other's business pretty well. If the phantom train was real and had been seen before, someone here must have some information. I started by talking to the regulars at Rosie's Diner, people who have lived in Pine Hollow their whole lives. 
But when I mentioned the train, they gave me puzzled looks and shook their heads as if I were making things up. No one had ever heard of a train passing through town, let alone a ghostly one. Frustrated but not giving up, I decided to visit the local library. The town's history is well documented there, and if the phantom train was connected to Pine Hollow's past, I wanted to find out about it. The library is a small, quiet building near the center of town. Mrs. Henderson, the elderly librarian who has known me since I was a kid, greeted me with a warm smile as I walked in. She is always happy to help with whatever I need. Good morning, she said, squinting at me through her glasses. What can I do for you today? I'm here to learn about the town's history, I replied, trying to sound casual. I'm particularly interested in any information about trains or railroads that might have run through Pine Hollow. Mrs. Henderson frowned as she thought it over. Well, there's never been a train line running through Pine Hollow as far as I'm aware, she said. The closest tracks are miles away from here. But let me show you some old records and see if we can find something that might be helpful to you. She took me to a small room in the back where dusty filing cabinets and stacks of old books lined the walls. As Mrs. Henderson started going through the files, I looked around at my surroundings, taking in the smell of musty paper and the quiet buzz from the overhead lights. After a few minutes, she handed me a pile of yellowed newspaper clippings and historical documents. These are from the early 1900s, she said. There was quite a bit of development going on back then, so there might have been some talk about building a railroad at one point. You may find something useful here. I thanked her and sat down at one of the tables, laying out the documents in front of me. Most of the articles were about Pine Hollow's early settlers, local businesses, and the construction of main roads. But then I spotted something that made my heart skip a beat. A headline from 1912 A Tragedy Strikes at Pine Hollow Station. The article talked about a devastating accident that happened during the construction of a small train station just outside Pine Hollow. The station was meant to be part of a new rail line connecting the town to nearby larger cities. But before the railway could be completed, a train carrying workers derailed and everyone on board died. After the tragedy, the project was abandoned and the unfinished station began to decay. Over time, the story of what had happened faded into local folklore and eventually, people forgot about both the station and the rail line. As I read through the article, a chill ran down my spine. Could this be linked to the phantom train that I had seen? Was there some connection between the mysterious train that appeared to me and the tragedy from over a century ago? I felt compelled to learn more. I went through all the other documents but found nothing else about the train or the station. It was as if the town had deliberately erased any memory of what happened, hiding it under layers of forgotten history. But I wasn't ready to give up just yet. I decided to head out and visit the site of the old station myself. Maybe there would be some clue that could help me understand how this past tragedy might relate to the Phantom Train. The location was deep in a thick forest on the outskirts of town, hidden away by years of overgrowth. I drove as far as I could before parking my car and continuing on foot, following the directions from the article. The forest was thick and overgrown, with a path that was barely visible beneath the tangled brush and vines. As I pushed my way through the trees, a growing sense of unease settled in my stomach. The air was heavy with the smell of damp earth and decaying leaves, and all I could hear was the rustling of wind through the branches. After what felt like an eternity of pushing through the dense foliage, I finally stepped into a small clearing. There, half buried beneath layers of undergrowth, lay the remnants of the old train station. The wooden platform had long since rotted away, 
and the rusty, twisted tracks were barely recognizable, hidden by moss and vines. I wandered around the clearing, looking for any sign of the train or the accident that had happened there so many years ago. But all I found was silence, the ruins of a forgotten project, left to time and nature. Just as I was about to give up, my eyes caught something small and weathered half-hidden beneath a pile of leaves. It was a plaque worn by years of exposure to the elements. I brushed away the debris and squinted at the faded lettering. In memory of those who lost their lives on this site, May 15, 1912, their spirits shall forever ride the rails. My heart skipped a beat as I read these words. It was clear that the tragedy had left an indelible mark not just on the physical landscape, but also in the hearts and memories of those who came after. A shiver ran down my spine as I read the inscription on the plaque. It was clear now the phantom train was somehow connected to the spirits of those who had died in the accident. They were forever bound to the tracks that had claimed their lives. But why did the train appear to me? What made me so drawn to it? As these questions swirled through my mind, the air around me seemed to grow colder, and the light began to fade. Checking my watch, I saw it was only 3 p.m., still hours away from sunset. Yet the shadows were lengthening, and a thick mist started rising from the ground, swirling round the trees like ghostly tendrils. Suddenly, the pull I had felt over the past two nights returned, stronger than ever. It tugged at my chest, urging me to stay and wait for the train to appear. I could almost hear the faint whistle in the distance, echoing through the trees. But I knew better than to linger. Something deep inside warned me to leave. Turning around, I hurried back the way I had come, fighting against the pull with every step. The mist thickened around me, and the trees seemed to close in, but I pushed on, desperate to escape the clearing. With each step, the pull grew stronger, but I refused to give in. The mist enveloped me, making it hard to see, but I kept going, determined not to let fear dictate my actions. Finally, I managed to break free of the forest and stumbled back to my car, gasping for breath. Though the pull had lessened, it was still there, a nagging sensation at the back of my mind, urging me to return to that haunted clearing. But I knew I couldn't go back, not yet. There were too many unanswered questions swirling in my head. What was the connection between the train and the accident? Why did I feel so drawn to it? And most importantly, how could I break free from its pull before it claimed me as its next victim? I drove back to town, my mind racing with thoughts. The more I pondered, the clearer it became that I needed answers before I could face whatever lay ahead. That night, I returned to Rosie's diner, determined to stay away from the phantom train once and for all. I had made up my mind to quit the night shift and leave Pine Hollow behind. Whatever the train wanted from me, I wasn't going to let it take control. But as the clock ticked closer to 3.15 a.m., I felt that familiar pull again stronger than ever before. It was as if the train could sense my resolve and wasn't about to let me go without a fight. The distant whistle sounded louder this time, echoing through the diner. I gripped the edge of the counter, trying desperately to resist the compulsion, but it was too strong. My feet moved on their own, carrying me toward the door. I stepped outside into the cold night air, which bit at my skin. The train was already there, waiting for me, its ghostly form shimmering in the darkness. As I approached, the doors creaked open and the pull became almost unbearable. I knew I couldn't fight it any longer. Taking a deep breath, I stepped toward the train, my heart pounding in my chest. The mist swirled around me, thickening the air with the scent of steam and smoke. As I approached the train, an odd sense of calm washed over me. 
The fear and dread that had been haunting me for days seemed to fade away, replaced by a feeling of inevitability. It was as though this journey was my fate, and there was no escaping it. I climbed aboard the train, and the door slammed shut behind me. The interior was dark, with only flickering lamps lining the walls for light. The seats were old and worn. The upholstery torn and faded. There was no one else on board, just me and the ghostly presence that filled the car. The train began to move, its wheels clattering against the tracks as it picked up speed. I sat down, my hands trembling, and stared out the window. Pine Hollow passed by in a blur, with lights flickering in the distance. As the train sped through the night, the truth hit me like a wave. The train wasn't taking me away, it was bringing me back to the moment of the accident, to the place where everything had started. The mist outside thickened, and the train's whistle wailed mournfully, echoing through the darkness. I felt the pull grow stronger, drawing me deeper into the past, into the tragedy that had claimed so many lives. The train hurtled forward, the landscape outside warping and twisting. The world around me faded away, replaced by dark, shadowy figures of passengers who had died in the accident. Their faces were pale and lifeless, their eyes empty. They seemed to be reaching out from beyond the veil, pulling me further into their tragic past. Then, all of a sudden, I saw it, the moment of the crash. The train derailed, and the cars tumbled off the tracks with the deafening screech of metal against metal. The passengers screamed in terror, their voices lost in the chaos. And then, everything fell silent. The world seemed to hold its breath for a fleeting moment before the train came to a grinding halt. The ghostly passengers slowly faded into the mist, leaving me alone once more. The car was empty and eerily quiet. The pull that had guided me vanished, replaced by an overwhelming sense of sadness and sorrow. It dawned on me that the train had brought me here to witness its final moments, to show me the tragic event that had bound it to these tracks for eternity. As I came back to reality, the train began moving again, but this time at a slow, deliberate pace. It carried me back toward Pine Hollow, and gradually, the mist cleared. The town reappeared in the distance, familiar yet hauntingly different. The train's whistle sounded one last time, a mournful farewell echoing through the night air as it came to a stop right in front of Rosie's diner. The doors creaked open, and I stepped off onto solid ground, the cold night air hitting my face. The train was gone, the tracks empty once more. I stood there for a moment, staring at where the train had been, feeling a sense of relief mixed with sorrow. The clock on the diner's wall struck 3.30 a.m., and everything around me fell silent. The phantom train had claimed its final victim. Its journey was over, and its passengers were finally at rest. And in that moment, I felt free from its pull forever. Story name. The frozen past. Do you know what I hated about my job? It was the relentless cold, so bitterly cold that no matter how many layers I piled on, it still seemed to cut right through me. My bones would ache like nothing else, and I couldn't escape its icy grip. There were days when I felt like I spent every single moment hunched over, digging in the dirt for hours without a break. It was exhausting both physically and mentally. Then there was the food, a constant source of frustration. We cooked these gloopy meals on portable stoves that all tasted exactly the same, no matter what the label said. And to top it off, sleeping in a thin tent on a flimsy mattress wasn't much fun either. 
with my skin tingling from the cold and my stomach churning from whatever mystery stew I'd eaten, sleep was nearly impossible. But despite all that, there were things about my job that made me love it deeply. As an archaeologist, every day brought new discoveries and insights into the past. I had just earned my degree and was working towards post-graduate qualifications, so being on my first professional dig instead of just a student project felt like a huge step forward in my career. Despite the hardships, it was all worth it for those moments when you uncover something that connects us to our history. We flew to the site a few days earlier, and it felt like an endless, bone-jarring journey that finally ended in the late afternoon. As we hurried to set up our tents, the barren landscape around us looked so unfamiliar that it felt like we were on another planet rather than in the far north of our country. The Alaskan border was just a hundred miles away. When the small plane that brought us here took off before nightfall, I couldn't help but feel a momentary surge of fear. I'd never felt so cut off from the rest of the world before. Checking my phone didn't help either, there was no internet connection out here. I gave myself a mental shake and got to work setting up my tent. It took me an hour just to figure out where all the poles went. There were four of us on the stake. I was the youngest, while Max, who was about ten years older than me but lower in rank, seemed to have some issues with his career progression. He had a bad attitude and constantly criticized me both directly and behind my back. I hoped he'd calm down once. We got more comfortable working together. Then there was Julia, a research fellow probably in her late twenties. She was very quiet and totally focused on the job, which I admired. I figured she could teach me a lot. Our boss was Professor Mitchell, who insisted we call him Mitch, kind of in an awkward way. He wasn't the biggest name in academia, but he was known for getting things done. Even though we were all connected to different universities, the money for this expedition came from a big corporation that supports various good causes through its philanthropic program. We had glossy brochures about it in our gear, but I'm pretty sure none of us read them. We just didn't have time for such things. Our work involved slowly digging inward toward the center of the excavation area, carefully clearing away frozen soil layer by layer. We were guided to the spot by satellite images that showed the outline of a structure. Local oral history mentioned an ancient civilization that lived here about a thousand years ago, known to have developed a fairly complex society, but we had no physical proof of their existence. We were determined to change that and find some concrete evidence to back up those stories. My nose was practically pressed against the soil as I tried to figure out if what I was seeing was a man-made fragment or just another pebble. And I heard Max shout yes. I looked up to see him fist pumping the air, still holding his trowel. It kind of ruined the macho effect, but he definitely seemed excited. I stood up and slapped my legs to get some feeling back into them, then went over to see what all the fuss was about. Julia and Professor Mitchell joined us too. What have you got there? Mitch asked sounding friendly as we gathered around Max. He had something in his hand that he was staring at like it was a treasure from another world. To me, it looked like some kind of coin. There were hints of gold peeking through the dirt on its surface, and it was about two inches wide. I tried to stay calm and professional, but I couldn't help myself. Wow. I exclaimed. This is amazing. Mitch held out his hand. Can you pass me the artifact, Max? He asked. Max handed it over, but I noticed a hint of reluctance on his face like he didn't want to share his discovery with anyone else. Mitch and Julia exchanged a knowing glance, which made me wonder if they had issues with Max's attitude too. Mitch pulled out a small brush from his pocket and started gently cleaning the dirt off the coin. Wow, I said again as the coin came into full view. 
the gold was dull but still shone brilliantly. But what really caught my attention were the markings on the coin. It showed a face in profile, just like many coins do. Only this face looked terrified. It was unmistakable. Fascinating. Mitch muttered as he turned the coin over and continued to clean it meticulously. On the other side, another face appeared. This time, the eyes were crossed out with X's. It's almost like they've been scarred out so that the person depicted cannot see, Julia commented. Not see what? I asked. Mitch looked at me and said, whatever scared the living daylights out of whoever's on the other side of this coin, presumably. His tone was casual, but I could tell he was just as excited as the rest of us. Meanwhile, Max's attention had shifted back to the ground, where he was uncovering another coin. And there were more coins lying close to the surface, dozens of them. Mitch clapped his hands together and said, All right, team, let's bag and tag these finds. I think we've made a major discovery here, but we need to let the artifacts speak for themselves instead of imposing our expectations on them. Julia nodded enthusiastically, and so did I. Max hadn't taken his eyes off the coins the whole time. Over the next few hours, I almost forgot about the cold, even though the wind had picked up and it was getting colder by the minute. When we finally headed to the main tent, which we were using as our storage and study center, it was a struggle to walk upright with all the layers of clothing on. Our four individual tents were lined up about a dozen feet apart, facing the entrance to the main tent. Inside this larger tent, supplies were piled up against the walls of food, first aid kits, and communication equipment that hadn't worked in the freezing conditions so far. There was also a pistol for scaring off any curious wildlife that might wander too close. Under Mitch's supervision, Julia lay the coins out on a clear plastic sheet and started photographing both sides of each one. I then weighed them and assigned individual serial numbers. There were 32 coins with a range of truly remarkable and bizarre markings. Some showed faces screaming in terror, blinded eyes. Others depicted groups of figures fleeing from something unseen. Bones like wide-eyed skulls and rib cages, and even bodies piled on top of each other, some with flames rising to show bonfires of cadavers. After noting down the last serial number, I turned to Mitch and asked, What do you think these designs represent? The professor kept his focus on the coins as he replied, Maybe the people living here a thousand years ago experienced something catastrophic. It could have been a deadly disease that led them to destroy bodies to prevent its spread. Or they might have faced an attack from another race not native to this area and tried to flee. These are just theories for now, and we have a long way to go before we can present solid evidence. Whatever happened, Julia added, the artists who made these coins were inspired by something truly terrifying. There was a moment of silence as we all lost ourselves in our thoughts. Then Max spoke up, I think they are beautiful. The silence that followed felt really uncomfortable. Finally, Mitch cleared his throat and said, Well, it's been a long day. Let's all try to get some sleep. I welcome this idea. Maybe tonight I'd actually be able to sleep, I thought. Good night, everyone, I said. Good night, James, Mitch replied. Don't let the bed bugs bite, Julia added with a smile. We started heading towards the tent door. Max didn't seem to be moving at all. Is there a problem, Max? Mitch asked him. Max was silent for a moment. The intense look on his face that I noticed when he first held the coin hadn't changed. Max, Mitch repeated, this time more firmly. When Max finally spoke, it surprised me. I will stay here and guard the coins, he said. Mitch looked confused. 
there's no one else around for miles, he pointed out. And we're not going to do anything with the coins except study them. At that, Max's face darkened. You idiots, he spat. These coins will change the life of whoever claims this discovery, and you think it'll be you, Professor? As he spoke, Max moved closer to Mitch, practically spitting in his face. Mitch flinched back. Please, Max, Julia said. Calm down. She reached out to place a hand on his shoulder. Max lashed out, striking her arm. She winced and held her arm to her chest. That's enough, Mitch yelled. Then he gently led Julia out of the tent. Jeez, man, I said to Max. You're way out of line. He glared at me with pure hatred in his eyes. I wanted to say more, but decided it was better to back off. There was clearly no reasoning with him. Back in my tent, I couldn't stop shivering. The short walk from the main tent had only taken a few minutes, but the weather had worsened rapidly, making it feel even colder. I glanced outside several times over the long hours that followed and knew I needed to wait for the conditions to improve before doing anything else. I had a small burner stove and some leftovers that I could reheat. I rationed myself and tried to be patient, but it was hard to keep track of time. The only real measure was my growing hunger after finishing my meager meal. Eventually, I decided there was no choice. I needed to leave my tent to get more food and reconnect with Mitch and Julia. As for Max, I could only hope he'd come to his senses. I stepped out of my tent and froze at the sight of blood staining the icy ground. Two lines of red ran from Mitch and Julia's tents into the main tent. I swallowed back bile and hurried forward. If they were hurt, I needed to help them. I pushed through the entrance flap. A scream formed inside me as I saw what was waiting inside. A hideous creature was crouched over Mitch and Julia who lay motionless in a growing pool of blood. The creature was ripping apart Mitch's cheek, mutilating his face. It was a twisted version of the human form, once Max himself. I could still see trace of his features in its sickening appearance, sunken eyes like dark pits, skin stretched tight over protruding bones. Terror gripped me. A coldness fueled by fear worse than anything nature had ever inflicted on me froze my body and soul. I stood there, frozen in place, as the creature looked up from its gruesome work, alert to my presence. Then it spoke, its words halting and strained, as if speaking was a forgotten skill that needed to be relearned. Look at you, it said, so afraid. So pathetic. Are you going to run away from me and save yourself? The creature then looked down at Mitch and Julia's bodies, now lifeless and covered in blood. Then it continued. Or are you going to burn the corpses, like they did a thousand years ago to try and save them from being consumed? It asked, then smiled. I would welcome that. I like cooked meat. Then it placed a wad of flesh it had torn from Mitch's face into its mouth. In that moment, I realized with shocking clarity that the creature was going to come for me next. It would kill me and feast on my body. All mine, it muttered. My coins, my blood to drink and bones to crunch. All mine. As it spoke, I knew I had only one chance I threw myself at where the pistol lay, grabbed it, and fired all the bullets into the creature up close. It howled in agony and fell to its knees. It was badly injured, but not dead. Its eyes flared with insanity as it dragged itself out of the tent, leaving a trail of blood behind. I stood there, panting heavily, and then began to weep. I was alone in a nightmare from which there was no escape. Five days had passed since that horrific night. 
I buried Mitch and Julia as best I could in the frozen ground. But when I checked their graves the next morning, they had been desecrated and their bodies were gone. The creature had its feast after all. It hasn't come for the coins yet, but I'm ready with a reloaded pistol. Until then, I'll hide this journal in hopes that someone finds it if I don't survive the horrors of this cold, desolate place. My name is James Peter May. I am 22 years old. And right now, I can hear the creature outside. It is here. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more. Hit the bell icon so you never miss an update. See you in the next one.